Here's a little murder mystery. One morning, police find the body of a murdered woman, her head bashed in by a clock. Its hands rest at ten o'clock. Her broken watch shows the same time. A doctor arrives and estimates the time of death based on body temperature at between 9.45 and 10.15 the previous evening. Phone records show the woman made an emergency call at 9.57, but the line was then cut. So here's the question. What time was the woman killed? It's possible, of course, that one of these pieces of evidence is wrong. The phone company's records may be wrong. The clock may have been slow or fast or broken on another occasion. So it's very remotely possible that all the evidence is wrong. So what makes us confident that each piece of evidence is right? It's the fact that they all point to the same time. If each piece of evidence was wrong, then the times they point to would be all over the place. The fact that they all point to the same time is called consistency. Consistency is what turns an observation into evidence, and we all use it all the time to make deductions about what happened in the past. In the story of the Earth Made Easy, I showed four photographs and asked people to deduce which was the earthquake, the tornado, the hurricane, and the flood. I asked a lot of creationists to take the test, but they were either vague about their results or refused to tell me whether they got the right answer and how they derived it. I suppose an admission that we can work this out is an admission that we can work out what happened in the past. But it doesn't matter, I know they got the right answer, and we all know how they derived it. They looked for the same things any rational person looks for, consistency. If people living in this town told you this damage was caused by an earthquake, you wouldn't believe it. Why not? Because the limited extent of the damage is inconsistent with an earthquake, or a flood or a hurricane come to that but the single trail of destruction is consistent with the path of a tornado. And if we look closer, we'll discover that brick structures remain undamaged, also inconsistent with an earthquake, while lighter objects have been strewn all over the place. So it really doesn't matter what our eyewitnesses claim. Maybe they were mistaken, or maybe they were lying, or maybe they're delusional. Eyewitnesses often get things wrong, but the evidence doesn't lie. We're intelligent enough to work things out for ourselves. Throughout this series, which took us from the beginning of our universe to the human migration out of Africa, through all of this the evidence has been consistent. All of the millions of pieces of individual evidence that form the hundreds of theories in dozens of different scientific fields, each and all are consistent with a single time frame and with each other. So the argument creationists use to suggest how one piece of evidence might possibly be wrong can't override one unanswerable fact, that all the scientific evidence is consistent. And none of the evidence is even remotely consistent with the universe, earth and every living thing in it being instantly created 6,000 years ago. So where an imaginary god was there to explain all the gaps in our knowledge, as we learn more about how the world works and how we got here, the role of this deity diminishes until it finds a place beyond the current extent of our knowledge inside the Big Bang. Cosmologists admit that they don't yet know what caused the Big Bang. I don't mind people telling me that their religion does have the answer and that it's the absolute unassailable truth. But if that's the case, then let's have the details. Whatever lurks inside the world of quantum physics and singularity can't be masculine or feminine. So what is this God thing? What did it do to cause the Big Bang? How did it all happen? If you don't know, then you really don't know much more than I do. The plain fact is that none of us yet knows, so let's stop pretending we do. Sitting round arguing about what we don't know is like ancient Greeks trying to use philosophy to work out what powers the sun. But one thing we do know is that we can't use the Bible or the Koran as evidence because the evidence we can see shows that these books are erroneous. Whatever it was that caused the Big Bang, we know from observations how the world has unfolded since then. There was no Garden of Eden, no man made out of clay and a woman made out of a rib. We know this because we can trace our origins very clearly back to Africa over 100,000 years ago. There was no instant creation of all the animals. We have overwhelming evidence that animals evolved over hundreds of millions of years. 
There was no global flood. We've dug and drilled through miles of rock stretching back billions of years, and the evidence for a worldwide flood 4,000 years ago just is not there. The universe was not made in a few days. It's nearly 14 billion years old, and we can see galaxies so far away that the light from them takes billions of years to reach us. And since we know all this, then we also know that the deity described in these holy books is a myth, a Bronze Age guess aimed at explaining the yawning gaps in our knowledge 3,000 years ago. The problem is, these books have been believed for so long, it's difficult to wean people off them. And that makes for a dangerous world in which Bronze Age myths hold greater power over some leaders and some nations than rational thought. I'm not just talking about the obvious dangers of religious intolerance. The world is facing unprecedented environmental challenges in the 21st century. We can't act under the assumption that a benign being is watching over us and will make sure we come to no harm. Or worse, follow a book that tells us the ultimate destruction of our environment is the will of some invisible deity, and that the best way to save ourselves is not to try to fix the damage, but to pray to the deity. This has been the futile practice of humans for thousands of years, natives praying to a volcano god instead of taking to their canoes. I hope this series has shown why we can't afford to be complacent. If we assume the fate of our world is sealed and out of our hands, then it soon will be. And finally, thank you to all those who've written in to tell me I'm going to hell. <laughs> You've probably realised by now that I'm impervious to these pathetic scare stories. And to those who've asked, what if I'm wrong? My answer is the same as yours. What if I tell you that you have to go outside right now and howl at the moon, or a monster will crawl out from under your bed tonight and boil you in acid? You may think that's nonsense, but what if you're wrong? As you can see, when it's tried on you, it just doesn't work. And to all those who've asked where I'll go when I die, I'm happy to say I'll be in the same place I was in 1947, and 1853, and 1622. I'll be a bunch of atoms spread across the landscape. Is that an awful picture? A hundred years ago, not being alive didn't bother me, so I don't suppose it'll bother me a hundred years from now. Let God's pale archangel the Grim Reaper come He can hack my bones, he can step up on my gravestone He can kiss my bone, I don't care Oh, and one more thing I'm delighted to take the blasphemy challenge and announce that I deny the Holy Spirit He was a blacksmith by trade he used to live on his own She was a little old maid She was all gristle and bone Just a crone that you might not have fancied yourself She was not born to attract She was lined up for the shelf If it were not for the fact The blacksmith loved her well He loved her like hell He used to grunt and sigh Fit to die But from afar for he was shy, as blacksmiths often are. She made a meagre livelihood from a homemade toffee that she'd sell up and down the neighborhood to a butterscotch and caramel. Cleontel, an optimistic machine.